couple of uh, thoughts just to uh, put them on the table before our commentators uh, react to our principal presenters. Uh, I was uh, in OLC when, which had a role in the judicial interviewing business. In fact, I see Judge Lamberth here, and I think we both met during your interview in my office. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what, it would be interesting to hear from Judge Lambert what he took away from that other than, boy, that was a waste of time. Uh, but I, I was reflecting on it as Jan was recalling the, um, the loss that the nation suffered when they uh, passed over the dean. Uh, and I served in Reagan and then the first part of the Bush administration. Uh, and I, so I, I heard a little bit of the scuttlebutt, Dean, as to you know, how squishy you were. Should, should, and, should I leave? And, 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 I didn't use that word. I, I, I deliberately edited that out. Right. Well, but yes, that was what. I don't know if this was the gravamen of the complaint, but for a long standing period of time, the Office of Legal Counsel and the Solicitor General had uh, this running argument over the constitutionality of the Key Tam Statute. Mm -hmm. Now, the Key Tam Statute is the False Claims Act, and it goes back to the origins of the nation, and it allows a, a private citizen, as you know, to step up to sue for fraud, waste, and abuse when the government has not, and to share in the proceeds in the event that the lawsuit is successful and the United States has dragged its feet. Um, and there is a lingering issue about whether or not there's Article Three standing for the plaintiff in, in the context of Ketam. This drives Senator Grassley to distraction. Uh, and, uh, but it's one of the most arcane and small and inconsequential <laughs> matters in the universe. Uh, except for the fact that people who have an absolutist ideology view it as the mortal sin by which Congress can create standing in a private party, thereby subvert the entire separation of powers upon which the edifice of the Constitution will come crashing down. <laughs> now, no names to be mentioned, but my successors were in this absolutist category. <laughs> and my successors indeed it seemed to me had a suspicion about this nice man at the end of the table on this very serious mortal sin. And from this, David Souter emerged. <laughs> I've studied all of the 237 opinions that David Souter had written as a Supreme Court Justice on the state of New Hampshire's Supreme Court. I can tell you all of those zoning variance disputes <laughs> told me absolutely nothing about what he would do with equal protection and due process and free speech and goodness knows whatever other issues. So my observation on this is the, those conversations that take place as part of the screening process can be as dangerously damaging and misleading if in fact they are not under some mature, prudent guidance of someone who is in fact capable of seeing an entire picture as opposed to blowing up a minor ideological disagreement into a complete disqualification, which I think is what happened in the Dean's case. And it's not the, and he's not the only one it's happened to. It has happened in other judicial nominations and it is a sorry part of the Federalist legacy in my judgment of the way we've selected judges. One, politics um, on the inside of the court in terms of the court's process, I'd be interested in getting some responses. I've been pestering any Supreme Court justice that comes into my path uh, with this idea. And that is they should try out just the, the crazy idea of writing the opinion first and then voting on it. I mean, because you know the process that they work now is, they hear the oral argument, they may have a little bit of familiarity with the briefing through their clerks, and immediately following the oral argument, they take the vote. 
Now, the thing we know from the study of the Blackman papers and the other papers in the Library of Congress is once you vote for something, notwithstanding the heroic example of Justice Thomas, you don't change your vote. By and large, you stick to it because it's embarrassing to go change your vote, right? Uh, and, and indeed, that's the record. 85, 90% of the votes cast immediately in conference are, 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 the, conference, are the votes of, of the bench ultimately, and the circulation of opinions doesn't change very much. Now, you have to take account of interstitial changes of where people bargained, but there's not a lot of bargaining because there's nobody in those hallways. They don't go out and see each other. So would the credibility of the court in fact be greatly enhanced if instead of us having the Chief Justice assign the opinion to somebody in, the, in his majority, if there was no vote taken and the person to get the assignment just simply happened to be the next person in rotation who had the requirement to then go to the books, the precedents, the statutes, and the means by which we interpret statutes, write it out and come back with a persuasive opinion. Now I realize this would reduce the productivity of the court from the current 79 projected cases to nine, but, <laughs> but just think of the quality and the credibility that would <laughs> emerge. Um, and then lastly, I, I, if either of those things are of interest to the commentators, I welcome uh, their, their thoughts, but the third thing that I think would be useful is as the provost mentions in his book, and I'll just briefly uh, quote from the blog about your, 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 your it's your blog about your book. The he, uh, he, he writes, the complaints had an impact, the complaints about the Bork hearing and the nastiness of the Bork hearing, so too did careful coaching of nominees by White House advisors who taught nominees how to avoid answering questions about their jurisprudence. The last four sets of confirmation hearings, Ginsburg, Breyer, Roberts, and Alito, have been civil, polite affairs. For people convinced that the confirmation process had become too political, these formal rituals must come as a relief but for those worried about congressional power to check presidential extremism, they are a worrisome development. Now, I bet many of us in this room have had the conversation with our non-lawyer friends and family members, all of whom said, wow, that Roberts, that Alito, to know that much about the law and to be as unflappable and as capable in its exposition is really, truly impressive. I, I think the outcome of those hearings for the general layperson was to say, we're really getting people of quality. Um, and yet, I think you're quite right, Chris, that the inside baseball among uh, the folks in this room and in rooms like it is that it told us very little. Notice the disconnect. Uh, and, and indeed, of course, Senator Kennedy writes immediately following uh, Justice Alito's hearing, never again, never again, of course, not until President Obama nominates someone <laughs> to the Supreme Court. Our next uh, speaker is someone quite familiar and like Jan, so very welcome in our midst and part of our Pepperdine family. We lend him out to Yale because <laughs> he, ha he tells us he has some, some job there, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that at, even though he is the South-made professor of law and political science at the Yale Law School, it's more important that he is a distinguished visiting professor at Pepperdine University, returns often to be among us and to lend us the insights of the person who wrote the only biography of the American Constitution, Akhil Ridawar. It's a great honor and pleasure to be back here. I, I have to confess I'm, I'm rather intimidated um, because Chris Eisgruber, my, my panelist uh, right next to me, has written this extraordinary book um, on this topic. Um, my friend Jan Greenberg has written an extraordinary book on this topic, which is all about Dean Starr, who just could easily have um, been on the court. Uh, our moderator was there when President Reagan was 
thinking about reshaping the federal judiciary. So I feel a little bit like Admiral Stockdale, you remember? And then, like, what, what exactly am I doing here? And I think the answer is having fun. So uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, several, um, uh, I think, interesting issues about the process. Here's one thing that Chris said. Um, adjudication does not involve horse trading. In general, justices don't trade across cases. I'll vote for you in this case on this topic if you vote for me in that case on that topic. And it's not completely ridiculous to imagine such a thing, um, uh, but um, it's seen as not properly judicial. It happens all the time in Congress and not inappropriately. You sponsor, if you join this bill that I'm sponsoring, I'll be able to, to support you in, in your endeavor. It, it, compromise is, is not um, evil, and, uh, but Chris says the way compromise happens on a court is different from, there, there, it does happen on a court, but it happens differently. It might happen within each opinion. There's negotiation back and forth, but not across opinions, and that's, that's interesting. Now, that's true about adjudication. There's not so much horse trading across issues. There is lots of horse trading in the process of picking judges, which is a more political process. And Chris told you that was by design. We could have imagined a world in which judges picked judges. That's how it happens often in Europe, de facto, is the way you rise within the judiciary system is you start out as a baby judge and sort of you move up and you acquire seniority. You actually, it starts even before then. You, you take different courses in law school um, and you have to take a civil service exam and prove you know something. Um, and here it's a little different. You have to know some one, whether it's Jean Tunney <laughs> or uh, uh, Kiekel or Murphy, or, or um, it's, a, it's a, the legal realist definition of a federal judge as a lawyer wants to do a senator. It's a different process. It's, it's one in which the judiciary, at least formally, is not self-replicating. So, but in Europe, basically, you advance um, dependent on um, the esteem and regard in which your colleagues hold you. The, your reputation among other judges is, is typically um, what matters, and, um, and they, in effect, um, uh, pick their own successors, rather like the Yale Law School faculty. Um, <laughs> it's that sort of, it's, but, but Chris says, by design, ours is a political process, and it involves horse trading. It involves horse trading between president and senate, um, and you heard um, uh, uh, Doug say about, about um, uh, Judge Byrne, in whose uh, um, name we all, are all gathered here. Um, there was a kind of horse trade compromise when the president and the Senate uh, represent different parties. The, the Senate basically says, well, we'll take one third and you take two thirds. And that's a certain kind of compromise. That's a horse trade. Um, um, there can even be horse trades. That's a horse trade within the confirm nomination confirmation process. There are horse trades between that game and other games. I'll give you this road, this bridge, this um, a dam, and you give me this seat. Um, um, and because it's the same people playing the same game, you got the president and the Senate, and they're playing all sorts of, um, uh, they're, 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 doing, they're transacting all sorts of things together. And, it's, um, uh, and things get traded across, not just confirmations, but across issues. So it is a horse trading process. It is a political process. Um, it's been that way by design from the beginning, from the very beginning. Um, the country is divided about the Constitution. Basically, half the country is for the Constitution and half the country is against it. Um, and it barely squeaks through. Um, and yet, and a couple of extraordinary things, the dissenters actually acquiesce. Even though it's very close, they all um, uh, accept the legitimacy of, 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 uh, that the others have, have, have properly prevailed. Um, which is extraordinary. And then the people in the majority, there's a compromise there. Well, maybe we should have a Bill of Rights. Maybe the dissenters were right about let, some things. Let's try to bring them on board. Let's, let's broaden the tent. Okay, but the country was divided, and here's the point about George Washington. He takes all of his nominees for the court from one side of the aisle. He only nominates people who supported the Constitution, not those who opposed it, and half the country did. And the first time he's gonna reach out to the so-called anti-federalists is gonna be for someone who by that time has actually, in effect, switched parties and become a federalist, um, Chase. So, so Washington appoints people from his side of the aisle. 
and Adams appoints basically only Federalists and tries to pack the judiciary with Federalists, and Jefferson tries to pack the judiciary with people from his side of the aisle. The first time a president openly reaches across the aisle, so to speak, to, to appoint a justice. We're not talking about lower federal court judges, but a justice of the other parties until Lincoln. Um, and that's field. Um, but, but by the time of Lincoln, it's actually not whether you're a Republican or Democrat that's the real issue. It's whether you're loyal to the Union or not. And Field was loyal to the Union. And Abraham Lincoln in 1864 is going to run on a kind of Republican slash Union Party fusion ticket in which his vice president is going to be a war Democrat, Andrew Johnson. That does not end well. Um, but um, uh, so even then, um, you see, it, it, there, you know, presidents pick people from their side of the aisle by and large. And here's a structural point. If it's okay for presidents to take those sorts of things into consideration when making nominations, it's equally okay for senators to take those sorts of things into consideration in the confirmation process. Just as a president can veto a bill when he's at the end of the game um, for any reasons that someone could actually support or oppose a bill, so too if the president can take philosophy, ideology, point of view into account when making a nomination, it's perfectly fair for the Senate to, to take all these things into um, a, account in, in the confirmation process. And this is what Chris is saying. And he was saying it when Republican presidents were doing the nominating. And I know Chris well enough to know that he will continue to believe that when it's Democratic presidents who are doing the nominating. We constitutional law people, so, you know, constitutions for a long time, what goes round comes round, when the shoe is on the other foot will be, you know, because we believe in procedure. You see, and then he's offering um, a, a general framework. Okay, a couple of other points, and then um, uh, I'll uh, turn the, the, the proceedings over to our good dean. Um, on a prior judicial experience, which was an issue that, that arose, we're seeing um, something very dramatic. Um, and I mentioned this uh, last time I was out of the, uh, or maybe two times ago when I was out of the Judicial Clerkship Institute, the judicialization of the judiciary. Even though formally, you see, it's a, quite a politicized process, political process, um, which politicians pick the judges by design because politicians have more democratic accountability. The way the system is supposed to work, you see, presidents are supposed to pick justices and justices are not supposed to pick presidents but see Bush v. Gore. Um, because when justices pick presidents, they're actually picking their own successors, and this is awkward structurally for the reasons that I've um, talked about. Politicians, the, the Senate picks its own leader. Uh, the House picks its own majority leader. The judges actually don't pick their chief. Politicians, they pick their own staff. The president picks his own cabinet officers. Justices don't pick lower federal court judges. I'm sure they wish they could, especially with the Ninth Circuit, but they don't get that. Um, um, uh, uh, so, so the politicians are picking the, um, the judges, but the process is becoming increasingly Europeanized in, in various ways. We're seeing what I call the judicialization of the judiciary de facto. We're seeing uh, a world where it's becoming increasingly important to have prior judicial experience. And increasingly odd when someone doesn't. You know who Harriet Myers is? She's a lot like Lewis Powell and Sandra Day O'Connor. Lewis Powell was the head of the Virginia, uh, the uh, ABA nationally. She was the head of the Texas Bar. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor was a person who had risen, a woman who had risen quite high um, within the political ranks. That's uh, Harriet Myers too. And yet, Harriet Myers was seen as sort of distinctly unqualified when that wasn't true even of Powell and, um, and O'Connor before her. And the reason why is today, prior she had prior, no prior judicial experience and that's becoming increasingly the credential that one has to have. That wasn't true for most of American history. The court that gave you Brown versus Board of Education, not one of them had prior judicial experience with the possible exception of Hugo Black who was on a police court when he was 27 years old, okay? <laughs> and the reason that Felix Frankfurter said, you know, there's no correlation isn't just because Felix Frankfurter, between prior judicial experience and being a great justice, wasn't just because Felix Frankfurter had no prior judicial experience, although he didn't, um, but because lots of his colleagues didn't either. So let me just give you just a quick historic run. Was today, for the first time in history, um, uh, Jan's book narrates, you know, the, 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 this tale as we move from so, Ra uh, Myers to Alito. For the first time ever, every single justice has prior judicial experience. That's never before happened until today, until this current court. 
And if Myers had been confirmed, it wouldn't have happened. Not only do they have prior judicial experience, every single one of them was a federal judge. Not just a federal judge, but a federal appellate judge. Not just a federal appellate judge, but a sitting federal appellate judge at the time of their appointment. This is extraordinary when you remember John Marshall, no prior judicial experience. He was a congressperson, secretary of state, great man. His successor, Roger Taney, no prior judicial experience. A cabinet officer, um, his successor, um, Sam, Salmon P. Chase, a great abolitionist, governor of, of uh, uh, um, Ohio, treasury secretary. He's the guy on the, on the $1 bill, not Abe Lincoln. He puts his own picture on the $1 bill. The guy, you know, if he wanted to be president, then he, you know, had a certain um, audacious, but no prior judicial experience, <laughs> nor with his successor, um, uh, um, uh, wait, and then Fuller has no, uh, uh, the next chief justice. We're into the 20th century now, okay? None of the chiefs had prior judicial experience. And then some did. A guy named William Howard Taft, he had a little bit of judicial experience. He was on the Sixth Circuit, Court of Appeals, but he'd done some other things too, you see. <laughs> and you're all thinking, yeah, he'd been president of the United States. No, I mean he was the Chancellor Kent professor at Yale Law School. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, but, um, um, uh, so, um, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, is, when he's on the court, first as an associate justice, he's governor of New York. He, run, he leaves the court to run for president. Um, uh, William Rehnquist, before he's um, an associate justice, no prior judicial experience. So, this is, an, you know, until very, very late, you have a court composed of governors, of secretaries of state, Charles Evans Hughes was Secretary of State, cabinet office, uh, John Marshall, cabinet officers um, um, uh, like, like Chase as, as, as well. Um, and um, so this is changing in our very lifetime. Um, and Myers was seen as like, distinctly unqualified in a way, again, even O'Connor um, didn't have lots and lots of high judicial experience. Um, she wasn't on a state Supreme Court, even wasn't on a federal court. Lewis Powell had none. Um, so we're seeing a change um, in that process. One final thing, people who have prior judicial experience, especially federal judicial experience, might be more inclined in general to be pe people of precedent in terms of Chris's judicial philosophy because what they do for a living is apply Supreme Court precedents. That's why they live and move and have their being. And if you look at which justices have, and that's not the only principled approach that a, a, a justice could have to be a present person. You could be a text history and structure person. That's a, an alternative um, principled point of view. You're less likely to be a text history and structure person. The sort of first principles, let's look back at the Constitution, if you've had all that beaten out of you after many years of being a lower federal judge, lower federal court judge, when yours is basically not to reason why, don't look at this, it will confuse you, just follow U.S. reports. <laughs> so the people in the 20th century who are the most likely to actually rethink precedent have been the people with no prior judicial experience, Hugo Black, a great senator, or very little prior judicial experience, not so much for Justice Thomas, for example, not even that much for Justice Scalia, not a long, long, long time. Um, um, see, either not very much at all, and or lots of executive branch experience, um, where certain people work for the executive branch, maybe a justice, Chief Justice Roberts, definitely um, Rehnquist and, and Scalia, um, uh, uh, have a certain point of view that's not merely sort of looking at the Supreme Court case law to understand all important constitutional issues. So the people that are most likely to be real idea people other than precedent people are the ones who haven't been on the court for a long time, uh, on a court for a long time. I do want to introduce the, the dean momentarily. I just want the footnote to uh, Akil's last comment. Of course, he he slipped in there that Rehnquist had no prior judicial experience. Now that's exactly right, and he also had the little a vague amendment that he had some executive experience. This is the key, this is the Rosetta Stone that you're missing <laughs> in that picture. Rehnquist, Scalia, Alito, the Office of Legal Counsel. Come at, come at. Um, head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, but now, think about President Obama, who, when quizzed, who would he nominate to the court? Actually, the silly question that Rick Warren asked, who would you not, who would you denominate from the court? <laughs> um, 
What did he identify? What, what did he identify as the missing ingredient from, you know, the you know the perfect candidates of Rehnquist, Scalia, and Alito? Um, he identified the absence of empathy. Empathy. The ability to stand in someone else's shoes, the ability to understand the person who's marginalized and who's outside the system and who doesn't necessarily have influence by means of wealth or power. That tends to suggest to me that our sitting president has an interest in nominating people to the bench who may not, in fact, be people who are only anchored in precedent. And that, in fact, if he's going to make the kind of change that Bill Brennan is associated with, he's going to be, in fact, looking for that other experience. Not to the total disregard of the necessary requirements of intelligence, which, of course, the president has in great abundance, uh, but also this other quality, as he describes it, 